So I did an introduction explaining how I'm going to talk about the process of my insane divorce. And there are some people whose divorces I see and I think, oh, wow, this one is not garden variety. It is either going the distance or it has gone the distance. And some like seem like they're really bad, but it's really for five minutes. It's like Demi Moore and Ashton Kutcher seem like it was going to be bad. It was really not a big deal. Sophie Turner and um, Joe Jonas, it seemed like it was going to be bad, but like, it seems like it won't, you know, a year, two years, that's child's play. When you, when you've had a decade year long divorce, that's serious shit. Like Kelly Clarkson has had a really long divorce, but also this was her manager and it's, it's commingled and like word to the wise, please do not be like working in a financial way with someone that you're married to. It's just not going to end well. It's just not a great idea. People do it. Um, And it doesn't mean that every situation is bad, but it's just not a great idea. So I met my ex at a nightclub. It was a place called 10 June, and it was the anniversary of this place opening. And I was out with two friends of NeNe Leakes's because I was doing an appearance for the brand Frangelico of all things who wanted to get into business with me and do some version of a cocktail because of my skinny girl cocktail success, which hadn't launched yet. It had just been so popular me talking about a skinny margarita because I invented the skinny margarita. And because I did that, I just was influential in that space. So I was an influencer before influencers existed really. And um, they wanted to do a deal with me for that. And they threw a party for me at the Warren Tracomi salon at the plaza and Nene Leakes stopped over. This is when she was like Andy's favorite. And she stopped over to say hi, cause I invited her. And she said, I have to go to something with Andy. I think he brought her to Anderson Cooper's house that night. And cause Anderson loved Nene too. And she said, and her friends were there and she left her friends at my party. So I took her friends out to two different places. I first took her friends to a Gotham magazine party unbeknownst to me with only 250 people there, Beyonce, who I think was on the cover, but it may not be true. And she performed and they were freaking out thinking I was the coolest person that ever lived. Beyonce performed for 250 people. It was nuts. And then we went to STK in the meatpacking district because 10 June wouldn't let us in. And then I texted the owner and said, like, let us in, like kind of, you got to let, you know, whatever you got to let us in. And so we went to 10 June and it was, I guess their anniversary. And there was a lot going on that night. And my ex was there with a girl who, um, had dated Russell Simmons and was a sports illustrated model, sports illustrated model. And she, I think was a fan of mine. And I ended up meeting him and interesting that this is, I mean, it could be perceived as a red flag or as something admirable, but he lied and said that his car was down there, but he left his car and said that he'd take a ride from me and my driver. So that night I had a driver for the night and his car was downtown near the club but he pretended that it wasn't so he could ride with me uptown. And then he asked the driver to take him back downtown to get his car so then he could go home. So it could either be endearing that he wanted to hang out with me or a lie and that he wanted to really hang out with me because, you know, maybe because his friend knew who I was, et cetera. And he had already dated someone that is, parents didn't approve of, but that was on another reality show. I don't want to get into too much specific gossip about someone else, but I didn't know this till later that he had dated someone else on a reality show. And there weren't as many reality shows then as there are now. So this is like probably like 15 years ago. And he had already dated someone from another reality show that, that later presented as like some version of a red flag to me. But anyway, we, um, he was always available to do what, whatever. And I, I thought that was positive because 
I was just coming up and I was just starting to have a career and he was always available. And I thought with what I want to do and how far I want to go and traveling and working and I didn't have a kid then. So I was willing to go anywhere and do anything and go to anything. He was always available and he was also really super charming, which my, this life coach that I know believes that charming is usually only used for men, not women. And that it's not in small, tiny doses, it's a positive, but that in large doses, if it defines someone's personality, if like charming is the first word to describe someone, it's toxic. It's a toxic trait because he says that charming owns someone. You don't have charm. Charm has you. So for men and that because women aren't usually described as charming and that charming is something that works for you. Like when you, you know, you say something and people like it and they're like, you know, they want more of it and you give them more of it. And it sort of ends up feeding you because it's addictive because it just works like, Hey, how are you? How's your golf game? You know, like a lot of just like being charming becomes an addiction and being charming is really attractive to, um, women. If you're attracted to men, to women, but it's something that you're attracted to initially and then eventually it becomes nauseating. And you guys know what I mean. Like when there's somebody who's like, you know, the 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 one that's just got that light and always charming everybody. And and I dated someone else in my life who was super charming and like could really intoxicate anyone, but it becomes like insufferable after a while. So anyway, there was a lot of charm there. And I really was attracted to that because I thought it was really, because um, it was charming. <laughs> Because it's it's charming and it's something that um, we perceive as positive, but it ends up being something that is a toxic trait. So anyway, we just sort of hung out and dated. There wasn't really an attraction for me. It was more of like something in my mind, which I've done before, where I convince myself or I tell myself or I use logic to say to myself that I should be into this. I married that years ago someone that I cared about and that was a friend, but I convinced myself that I should be into to it versus just like your body from a visceral perspective, knowing that it's into it. And I don't think I had very high self-worth at the time. Like I, I maybe was just like living in my little small shitty apartment and didn't know what was going to happen with me and didn't really have money and, or, you know, had, had just started to make money, but like, didn't like the way it felt to be alone. Let the universe tell me that I was in my late thirties and that you're supposed to, um, be having kids by then, or you're supposed to know what road you're on. I didn't really have family. So I had no safety net. So I had no, um, security with money and no idea. And I just like, I think I just wanted to be wanted and thought that there was like at that age, you kind of had to know what road you were on. And by the way, I made the same mistake in, in my twenty early 20s. Like at so many stages as women, we think we're supposed to be like finished with the journey and know what stage we're supposed to be at. And, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're 65. I mean, there are people, there's somebody, I don't want to call her out, but somebody from the Housewives universe that's like in her almost 70 years old and like just, and is in a, just met someone and is in a great relationship. Like, we put these timelines and these clocks on ourselves and they make us make bad decisions. So anyway, I wasn't really that into him. I convinced myself to be that into him. And when I would hit a low during that general period, it would be like a security blanket. And I would like logically say, this is something I should do. It's exactly what I did in my twenties. Ellen DeGeneres is the one who says you will keep me, you will keep making the same mistake until you actually learn the lesson. So anyway, I, had a situation with a celebrity where a celebrity that is a big, big name, I'd say a list, if not a minus list that was interested in me. And I was intrigued and I felt I'm not worthy. And I went out with this person technically, like, I guess like twice or hung out with them like three times, no more like three or four. But I didn't, I ended up being like dis, I didn't sleep with them or anything, but I ended up being like disenchanted with them. And they, this was another really big, charming person. And it was a vulnerable weekend when I hung out with this person and ended up saying to like, ended up 
laying them out. Basically, I'm the type of person, it doesn't matter who it is. If someone I feel disrespects me in any way, even if it's like nuanced or uh, if it's just like if it's the way someone speaks to me or the way someone thinks they're entitled or the way someone treats me in a way I shouldn't be treated, I'll call them out. It could be anyone. It could be Brad Pitt. It could be Ryan Gosling. It wouldn't matter. So this person I did call out and I, it ended up putting me at a low. And also if you're a person who like either drinks or, you know, smokes pot or whatever you do, like, or you're tired, like when you when you're feeling lonely and you're feeling like vulnerable because you're not feeling like wanted or self-worth issues, you might go run towards another security blanket. And because of this situation with this person, even though I had already blown out my ex and blown out, you know, charming Mr. A, my ex, I was feeling a little bit low. And then I called my ex and that's when we got together. So it was sort of on like a low vulnerable point. And then it was off to the races. And there were moments of it being good, but it, they were very fleeting. It was in the very, very beginning on a free trip that I was offered when I took him, when it was like a beautiful hotel and there was like butler service and, and drinks all day. And like, that's a type of place you could definitely, you know, want to be intimate with someone and everything seems great because like, it, it's not reality. That's why the show The Bachelor can be problematic to me because it's definitely not reality. And who's not going to want to have sex with someone when you're in the most gorgeous place and it's sunny out and drinks are flowing and your room is amazing and you have housekeeping service and a butler and all that stuff. And like, so you got to kind of not judge a relationship during this, like the high crazy fantasy times. So we got into a relationship and this person said to me that they really were concerned about my age and that they really wanted to have kids and that I would have to think about getting pregnant within, you know, a reasonable period of time. And this was within the first couple of months of the relationship. Now, I did not think of this as a red flag. I don't know why I didn't. I think other people would think of it, but I guess some people think that, you know, 36 I think I was 36 or maybe 37. Like you are kind of your biological clock is ticking, but I wasn't 42. And I was also about to launch a liquor brand, but I led with like my heart and not my, my, my logic and my mind and not my gut and my stomach. And I kind of just was not being driven. Often I'm a person who gets in a car that says one destination and because it's feeling good in the moment I ignore the destination and I'm in the car and I'm like what where what the fuck and why am I in this car so I was in this car and I'm not blaming anyone else my body my own choice but I did get pregnant not too far into this relationship and before that, when we were dating, but it was getting serious, money was a conversation in my mind because then I didn't have that much, but I had more than this person and I just didn't want there to be a disparity. And even to this day, I don't want to be with someone who has less money than I do because it becomes a problem. I don't care what people say. I don't care what self-help people want to do on talk shows and talk about you have a common bank account and you pay for the dry cleaning together and you do all the shit. I don't care if it's it sets women back. I really don't give a shit. I'm just telling you, when a woman makes a lot more money than a man, it's going to lead to problems in 95% of the cases. So, And it may not be right away. You know, oh, yay, the man's staying home to take care of the kids. That's wonderful. That's so admirable. Somehow, somewhere down the line, it's going to feel a certain way to that man. I don't care if it's unpopular. I don't care if it's 2024. I have enough institutional knowledge to know that. So I wanted to understand how the finances were going to actually work. Like, what if I want a certain, you know, I hadn't sold my company yet. Um, that ended up happening during this marriage, which was a little bit unlucky because it ended up being the reason when we get to it, that you'll understand, holy fucking shit balls. It's the worst divorce in history, short of like physical abuse. Um, so I remember we were at the Waverly restaurant, which is a hip restaurant in New York. And we talked about it because I was thinking like, what if I want an apartment or like to buy something and how does that work? I'm buying something, but it's the first money I've ever made. And how does it all work? And what we came to was that I would buy, I would not mind buying the apartment or the place but that he would pay for like decor or like, you know, I'd pay for, I guess, a hotel room, but that he'd pay for incidentals or we ended up having an apartment and I paid for 
let's call it like 75, 65 to 75 percent of the rent I paid for. And I'm proud of myself that I did that that didn't bother me. It did end up bothering me, but I'm proud of myself that I even I don't know what the fuck and why I would suggest that, why I would think that was okay because I wasn't even that in love with this person to begin with. I was kind of convincing myself. And once I got pregnant, I was on the road and like you just and once you're doing a television show, you you feel responsible and you feel like a loser. And that's why if you're ever in a situation where you want to break up with someone or you want to not get engaged or all these things or you have a wedding plan, trust me, in the moment it seems like it's a big deal. It's not that big of a deal to everyone else. It just feels like it is. I've been through this before. It's something you've got to cut bait. If you know something's not right, you get the fuck out. Doesn't matter what your parents think. Doesn't matter how much money spent. Doesn't matter what television show you're on. It doesn't fucking matter. If you if you don't know that it's right, get the fuck out or sit still. But if you don't know that it's right, it's wrong. Just letting you know that. That's just a point blank fact. If you do not know that it's right, it's wrong. Particularly when you're about to get married. So I have I literally wrote a book called I Suck at Relationships so you don't have to because I've fucked every single thing up. But I am telling you with no stuttering, I know exactly what I'm talking about. And this is all true. Like you, I am an expert on this. Call my divorce lawyer, Ronnie Shindell, Heidi, or Alan Mayevsky, ask them if Bethany is an expert on divorce. Ask them if they've ever had a client that has been better at this than I was. Because I, I won everything I won by being the most organized, detailed, notebooks, everything. So like, I know what the fuck I'm talking about. Not about everything. I know everything I'm talking about about this with great certainty. I do not know how to put eyelashes on. I do not know how to do my own hair without it frizzing 20 minutes later when it looks like it's pin straight the minute I do it. I do not know how to download an app. I don't know how to get past a paywall on my phone and and read an article. I don't know how to do a lot of things. What I know is divorce, like the back of my hand. Every single solitary aspect of it, do I know it? So I, and I know relationships, I'm just an idiot, but I know what you should do. And what you should do is run like a thief in the night if you're not certain. And I was pregnant. I was not happy in my relationship. I kept going because I was doing a television show and I was very stupid. And because in my life, what I've done is something that you've probably done is like, say, this is what I did in my first marriage. Oh, the worst thing that ever happens is they'd be a good father. Oh, you know, you're marrying someone or being with someone because of how much they love you, not how much you love them. Shake your head up like a snowball and get the hell out of your own way and listen to what I'm talking to you about. Okay. So now... I'm pregnant. I get engaged. It feels wrong. It all feels wrong. And the way that we argue feels wrong and the way that I'm spoken to feels wrong and certain things feel wrong. It feels wrong that we were sitting at the Waverly talking about how the finances went. And he said to me, he referenced Nick Lachey and Jessica Simpson's divorce and said to me that Nick should have taken everything from Jessica. Because like, I remember they were in a relationship and they did a TV show and she was like the more famous one, the more rich one. And he did it with her. And this was a time when my ex was like kind of being on my television show or agreeing to be on it and said to me, she should take, he should have, he should take whatever he can get from her. I don't know why he said this to me. I don't know why he thought I wouldn't read through this. I think he was just being honest about what he thought. He thought Nick Lachey deserved a lot. And there's something about that that was such a fire engine red flag to me going, wait, what the fuck? But nevertheless, I ended up getting engaged and I ended up doing a prenup really fast that my lawyer said I should not allow you to sign. But I said, I'm marrying a regular guy, a small town guy from a small you know, town family, a regular guy. He does not want my money. Famous last words. My lawyers were like, I didn't want to even get a prenup. My agent at the time and my lawyers were like, or whoever I had was like, you need, no, my agent was like, you need a prenup. Like you need a prenup. Don't be an idiot. I was so naive. I was a late bloomer. I had made a goddamn dollar and I was in my late thirties and I was like, wait, what? No. Like I was so trusting. I'm still so trusting in many ways, but I did not even think I needed a prenup. I did not want one. It made me uncomfortable. It's like, it made me so uncomfortable. And then talking to the lawyer made me feel uncomfortable too. Standing my ground made me feel uncomfortable. It made me feel, you know, and then it's when like, you're not pulling up your big girl panties in a business meeting and being like, absolutely not. Like as a grown ass woman now, I don't go, goo goo gaga, I'm doing a business deal with you, but I'm scared. I don't know. I trust you. Lollipop. Like, what the fuck? You're doing, you're trying to be successful. You're talking to a lawyer. Tough shit. 
big girl panties are hard to pull on. Business is tough. But if you're going to get legally married, you're going to be in a contract with someone, you're going to get a prenup and you're going to pay attention and you're going to get the best deal you can. And you're going to listen to your lawyer and you're going to get a good lawyer because every day when the lawyers are talking to the lawyers, he would call me and say, you know, wow, he doesn't trust me. And wow, we're doing a prenup and wow. And all this stuff. And I would get sucked in because that's what lawyers are supposed to do. I see it on business deals now that I know years later, what's supposed to happen is the person you're doing the deal with in the business deal is supposed to call you up and say, wow, your lawyer is really a fucking piece of shit. And this is what they wanted me to sign. And then you go goo goo gaga, like a big female baby. And then you call your lawyer like, no, I don't want to do this. He said that you, and they're like, this is the process, Bethany. Trust the process. That's the part of it. But no, you're not listening because you're an idiot. And I know Kelly Clarkson went through this and I know probably Ariana Grande went through this and I know Halle Berry went through it. And I know all of the women that I've read about having these shitty divorces that are paying, they went through it because they did the Goo Goo Gaga program that gets you fucking nowhere. And they didn't pull on their big girl panties. And if your big girl panties want to get married, which is not a romantic act, being in a relationship and being in a commitment is a romantic act. Signing a contract And being in a contract with another human being, I don't care if you want to have kids. I don't give a shit. That is a business deal. So you can hear it or not, but you're a dummy if you're not hearing it because I went through torture to tell you this and get Laura fucking Wasser, the most powerful attorney on or get any attorney on and let them tell you different because they won't. It's a contract. You're getting into a legal agreement. Be Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell and stay together the rest of your life. And then now they're effectively legally married because of common law marriage after I think 10 years or 14 years. But it's called the tough shit program. If you're big girl enough to go get married, you're big girl enough to listen to your lawyer and not succumb to the bullshit. Okay. That's the hard true facts. So once I heard that my ex thought that my ex had been in a relationship with a reality star, had lied about coming in the car uptown with me saying that they didn't have a car because they wanted to be in my car with my driver, had said that Nick Lachey should have taken everything from Jessica Simpson. Well, guess the fuck what? I should have signed a prenup, but I was goo goo gaga stupid and I didn't know anything and I didn't want to and I signed a shitty one. Oh, and, and, and while we're at it, the shitty one that I signed said that I would give um, a percentage of my business, which to this person, and it didn't define what my business was worth then. So the percentage of what it ended up being when I landed on the cover of Forbes and I ended up selling it, they wanted a percentage of that big number. I ended up having to spend two years and a couple of hundred thousand dollars with a forensic accountant to determine what my business really was worth on that day. So a sign of value there. Otherwise, you're going to spend all this money doing all these other things. But wait, there's so much more, okay? And I don't want to go too fast because we're going to make this a lot of chapters, but I could talk about this for for 10 years straight because I know so much about it. So I ended up signing a shitty prenup, but better than not having a prenup despite it even being a shitty prenup. And sometimes a prenup will get thrown out and sometimes we'll dispute it anyway. So, but you got to have a prenup and you have to be a big girl. And... You have to really, really listen to the red flags. 